And <clears throat> turn with me to Philippians. And um, while you're turning there, I'll just give it a little explanation <clears throat> why we're having class tonight. I, I gave permission to the families that had little kids or whatever to be able to go to parties or do stuff like that. And, uh, but I decided that I needed to <clears throat> not just cancel the class because this is my second shot at trying to finish Philippians. And if I cancel this one, and I think we cancel at least one or two just as work days for the conference, one, sure. then we're going to do it for the conference. Then who knows with Christmas people go, I don't know, you know. And I just went, you know, I need to, <laughs> I need to try to get in everything that I can. <clears throat> and in fact, this class, I'll probably start that usual thing that I do about this point when I'm teaching. I stop teaching and I start reading. <laughs> it's the only way I can get through anything. I mean, I can, I, well, we'll see just as we start here. Um, uh, there's one word that, you know, caught my attention uh, in these scriptures. <clears throat> so let's, um, Let's look at Philippians 2, <clears throat> and let's go ahead and read 5 through 10, um, or 5 through 11. <clears throat> Happy trick or treat. <laughs> uh, who we got on Skype, by the way? Um, Mary and Sharon. Hi, Mary. Hi, Sharon. Love you guys. We love the moms. <laughs> All right, Philippians 2, <clears throat> verse 5. Let this mind be in you which was also in Christ Jesus, who being in the form of God, thought it not robbery to be equal with God, but made himself of no reputation, took upon him the form of a servant, and was made in the likeness of men. And being found in fashion as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient unto death, even the death of the cross. <clears throat> okay. On the board, I have a chart. And at the bottom, it's uh, crucifixion. And this is what we just read. We read these verses uh, 5 through <clears throat> 8. And that's what this, this little box represents. It represents verses 5 through 8. And those verses represent... The self-humbling, you know, that, I don't know if you ever really noticed that little phrase that says Jesus made himself of no reputation. You know, I mean, it is trying to signal that these are acts of Jesus along the way, that this is something he's doing. In other words, in other words, <clears throat> they didn't humble him. They didn't make him of no reputation. You know, um, you know, sometimes we think, um, well, people are putting me down or saying bad things and, or maybe even ruining my reputation. Well, that's not the same thing. That's not you making yourself in the reputation. That's others. You see what I mean? It doesn't count. <laughs> it's, it's, a, it's a different thing. And, and this is what this class, and, and I will say this, <clears throat> Tonight is signaling a big change now for me to be able to do my best to get into just some of the stuff that I have seen, particularly in relationship to verse 9, 10, and 11, <clears throat> uh, and where all that comes from. And this is that introduction right there. Okay, so <clears throat> verses 6 through 8, crucifixion. But then... Verse 9 begins with this word, wherefore. I want you to all notice that word there because it's a, it's a word that changed my life. It, 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 it did. The word didn't change my life. But the, the, to, to be able to comprehend the magnitude of what God was saying when he used that word. Um, which I did, which I didn't comprehend before that moment. You know, I, I had no clue. Uh, it was, 
all of this was good. It was more of a doctrinal thing. It was more of a, you know, teaching us about Jesus' death and Jesus' resurrection. And I didn't see the, the real meaning of that word, wherefore. <clears throat> but wherefore is the bridge. It is a linking word between the first part, the crucifixion, uh, the first several scriptures, and the last several scriptures dealing with the resurrection. And I drew it in a chart in this manner because I wanted to put what was below or the crucifixion in terms of what was humbled and in terms of what was obedient unto death, in terms of what made itself unto, uh, no reputation. Um, you know, we get upset when people do that stuff to us. But Jesus didn't because they didn't do it to him. <laughs> he did it. He chose it. He knew he was going to do it. He knew that's what he existed for. He was, he was ready for it because it was his mission. And a lot of times we don't see, see that as our mission. Anyway, so that word wherefore uh, is, going to be, um, <clears throat> is going to be the, the impetus for quite possibly, depending on how many classes I get, the rest of the the rest of the course, I know. See, I said, that's what I said. I have to read, and I'll start reading in just a minute. But I have to, or we'll never get anywhere, you know. <clears throat> All right. So so the, the wherefore comes up in verse 9. Wherefore, God also hath highly exalted him and given him a name which is above every name, that at the name of Jesus... Every knee should bow of things in heaven and things in earth and things under the earth, and that every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. <clears throat> All right, so um, <clears throat> when, <clears throat> when I begin to sort of see, and I don't, you know, I, I don't claim to see see everything i need to see much more in relationship to this one word but when i began to to have my eyes opened uh, <clears throat> it helped questions to come and most of you who know me and know the way that i teach man i mean i ask questions i'm a question asker i just i i i can't just <laughs> Maybe it's because I came out of the 60s. I don't know, but I question every. But I don't do it in a negative way. I don't do it in a rebellious way. I do it in a, I, honestly, almost childlike. I, I don't understand this. Why is this? Well, what about this? And so uh, I, I started this thing that I'll read to you right here with a couple of my questions. Why did God raise Jesus? Why did God raise Jesus? Now, I know we go, well, you know, he didn't sin and all that. We'll get into that, but why? What was it that God saw in such a one that it caused him to raise, glorify, exalt, and make this one Lord of all? To gain the answer to these questions, we must first consider the kind of death that Jesus died. Why must we look only to the place of death to find that answer? We look to the cross because that is the ground from which this exaltation sprang in Philippians. It's the ground. It is, <clears throat> it's where the seed fell into the ground and died and sprang up to the heavens. <clears throat> It is placed before his exaltation, right? Verses 5 through. It's placed before his exaltation. And by use of the phrase, wherefore God hath, is given as the explanation for the resurrection. Now, I'll spend the rest of the time explaining that. <clears throat> it is the cause that brought about the effect. The cause, you know, you, you're familiar with cause and effect. It's the cause that brought about the effect. 
Uh, and also, you need to keep in mind, we're talking specifically now about these scriptures in Philippians. There are many scriptures that refer to the cross from many different angles, okay? But we just happen to be uh, doing a course in the book of Philippians. So that's why we're staying with the context that's right here. <coughs> um, it is the cause that brought the effect about, and no other reason is interjected as doing this or helping to bring this resurrection about, not in Philippians. But to consider the kind of death that Jesus died, we must first then ask a few more questions, don't we always? And I want you, I want you to try to think through this. I mean, this is stuff I ask, and I go, I don't know. I mean, I just, I, 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 my mind thinks up even weird questions. All right, so here's, here's one of the questions. <clears throat> Does it make any difference? Does it make any difference <clears throat> if God raised him, raised Jesus, who was crucified, as opposed to raising Jesus who died because of old age, or an accident or an animal attack against his person. Does it make any difference, the resurrection? I mean, I just think that's kind of a good question. I mean, because it makes you think, okay, well, wait a minute, you know, is there, you know, I mean, could Jesus have just tripped, and fell, hit his head, and God raised him? You see what I'm saying? But this is all intimately tied with the kind of death that he died. All right. Now, if, if we say, well, I don't understand that or I don't understand that fully, which category I fall into, but, I, you know, that, that's how you start. You have, to, you have to, something must dawn on you to ask that can open a wider door to the heart of the Lord. And that's really what we want. We're not, we're not looking for more knowledge. You know, frankly, man, we just, I don't, I don't need any more now. I need the Lord. I want the Lord. And if this stuff isn't going to bring me to the Lord and more intimately in union and relationship with him and more clearly knowing the him that I love and worship, then to me, it's just, we're, you know, I, can, I might as well go over there to the University of North Texas and learn stuff, you know. You'll get a degree. I started to say you'll get a degree and get a better job, but not necessarily. <laughs> not now that it's. <laughs> All right. God did not just raise a dead man. You know, I'm sorry, but for a lot of the years in my walk with the Lord, I thought Jesus just died and he raised a dead man. The whole point is, well, he died, so I'm going to raise him, you know, because he's dead. He was dead. That's, you know, and when I say, and when I say dead, it's just, it means that, you know, he, he just quit breathing or something, you know, and, oh, well, we can't have that. <laughs> you know, I mean, can you see God the Father going, this is, this is mess with my plan. We're going to have to, you know, Dang, I didn't plan for that, for him to die like that. But the kind of death that he did die, God totally planned. And Jesus was already a, a willing partner, a willing sacrifice. <clears throat> All right, so uh, God did not just raise a dead man, and he did not simply raise his son because it was his son. All right, now. Y'all may all know that. I, it took me years to get, gather that one. I mean, I just, these scriptures help, these, this portion and this wherefore is one of the things that helped me realize that what Philippians was talking about and the relationship that, and the angle it was talking about in relationship to the cross uh, really was not talking about him as his son. <coughs> And that was like a crack in the armor where God started getting through to me. Hallelujah. <clears throat> uh, God raised him because of the kind of life he lived and the kind of death he died. And Philippians, remember, includes the incarnation and 
the crucifixion. Because Why? Do you remember why? We said because it wasn't the events. It was the nature in which he did all of this kind of stuff. And again, we'll, we'll, we'll spell that out more clearly as we go. <clears throat> um, uh, it was the spirit behind the actions in his incarnation and in his crucifixion. <clears throat> in other words, when we refer to the kind of death that Jesus died, we're not merely speaking of the fact that it was death on a cross as opposed to death by strangulation but that he died a sacrificial death. Hmm. Then it couldn't be death by strangulation. You know, you see what I'm saying? It was meant to be on an altar, if you will, and that cross was God's altar. It was meant to be that. And therefore, it begins to remove all, all forms of death that aren't sacrificial. So then you can say, well, no, he... You know, God didn't care what kind of death he died, you know what I mean, as long as he just died. No. No, he cared deeply because, because the kind of death that he died is going to determine if there's going to be a resurrection. Now, and we're, and we're going we're gonna to see that from a whole bunch of angles, you know. By the way, I love this stuff. I mean, I've spent the last four years, five years, just taking my time and walking through this garden, and I, I still got a lot, you know, I've made the first rose bush, and I've got, you know, now I've got more to go. <clears throat> um, let's see, did I get all that? Yes. The sacrifices, God, the sacrifices re required by God were to be free will offerings. So, they, so, so it was impossible for Jesus' death to count anything if indeed he was murdered. Now, in their heart, they did murder him, didn't they? But not in his heart. He, gave, he laid down his life. And that's key, you know. Um, uh, I always think of uh, the book of Acts, and I forget what chapter and verse right now, but it's, uh, I think it's in the first or second chapter there, and he says, but, you know, this, this Jesus God raised from the dead, but you by wicked hands. Well, God, by the determinate counsel of God, God wanted him to lay down his life and be a sacrifice. That's God's motive. Man's motive, you by wicked hands have crucified him. Okay. Well, there, there see, this is where we don't see clearly. Their motive in driving the nails in you does not matter to this situation. Doesn't matter. It's not an issue. We make it an issue. Well, I would, you know, I mean, uh, the example I've always seen, you know, I, 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 a lot of times, and I don't do this on purpose, but I sort of reading scriptures and I sort of visualize myself standing there and here's Jesus carrying the cross going up to Golgotha and there's crowds lining either side of the street, you know, and I'm kind of watching this thing and, and you know, kind of the way that most Christians will take up their cross and follow Jesus. It would be like Jesus carrying his cross up to Golgotha and all those people lining the street are going, go, go, yeah, yeah, we love you. You're doing a great job. This is going to be great. But, you know, they're spitting and, you know, condemning and, and slapping him and doing all this kind of stuff. You know, folks, as long as people know what we're doing in relationship to Christ crucified, um, then we, we're willing participants. But, the, but folks, the free will offering part has to do with the Father. Wherefore, what's the last part of that worth, uh, the verse? Uh, to the glory of God the Father. Um, your, your life 
has to be has to have one purpose to glorify the Father by Christ, not just to glorify the Father. Every Christian will say that, you know, but that by Christ to glorify the Father. You know, what does it say in what, Ephesians or whatever that uh, uh, God would be glorified in the church by Christ Jesus? And, and when you realize that God wants that, that offering, that selfless one, whether it was 2,000 years ago on the cross or now in us, and that that's what pleases him, that's my beloved, you know, see, he looks at a crowd and he goes, that's my beloved son. He goes, oh, by the way, John, you're doing a good job. Remember at the baptism, he didn't, he didn't say that. You know, he didn't go, and hey, Bob, you're really, you know, I like the way you've been doing your job. And, hey, you know, your family's looking good and all that. He didn't do it. He, God opened the heavens for the first time. The spirit descended like a dove, and he says, this is my beloved son. He didn't go, so you guys better treat him right. He said, the one thing that is the, the most powerful thing in his heart in whom I'm well pleased. I mean, when the Spirit of God first breathed a little bit of that air, I realized this, this scripture is trying to identify to us who have ears to hear and eyes to see how to please the Father. <laughs> I just want by Christ, of course. You know, we, we would know that, but we go, but me too. Yeah, but, you know, we would. We go, well, I do good things too, and I know I please God all the time, and I know he's so very happy with me. No. He, he put Christ in you so that you could, so you could give him Christ. I mean, yeah, yes, but no, not you, but Christ in you, see? That's what Paul said, not I, but Christ in me. That's what he said. That's the, that's the teaching of the scriptures. And that's that, that was the view had by the first century church. And that was a, an understanding of, of what seeing really was. That was an understanding of what seeing really entails. Oh, you look at the Father, you look at the Son, you look at the Spirit, and you go, you know what? This whole thing's pointed toward Jesus. <laughs> you know, the word of the Father, the dove coming down, you know, this, you know, heaven, clouds moving back, and, you know, and you see that again with, with uh, them on the Mount of Transfiguration, and, and there's Peter, James, and John, the, uh, the unholy trinity, not really, but, you know, not, you know. <laughs> and, then, and then you've got uh, Elijah and Moses, and they're all there, and so... As soon as, as soon as Peter says, you know, hey, you know, I've got an idea. It's a good thing that we're, me and John and, and James are up here because we can build booths for all of you guys. And all of a sudden, a cloud comes over, overshadows everything but his son. You don't see anything else. It says, uh, but Jesus only. And a voice again says, this is my son. As soon as somebody starts trying to get somebody else in the picture, he shuts them all out. And, and, and uh, those, are, those are not meant to be stories. I mean, what good are, I mean, I mean, just think about it. what good are stories? Does stories transform your life? No, reality as seen in that story Again, like being a bystander and watching this thing, and all of a sudden the heavens open, you go, hmm, that's never happened as from the beginning of time. You know? And then all of a sudden the Holy Spirit shows up, and then you see the Father, and there's Jesus, and you're going, whoa, there's three of them. Well, that was a revelation to the Jews, okay? <laughs> no big deal to you, huh? You just go, yeah. You know? <laughs> but, you know, they're going to. But they're three in one, but they're all, I mean, the other two are pointing toward this one. All right. So, 
Uh, so we're, you know, here we are, we're, we're in a situation, people are mistreating us or saying bad things about us or crucifying, you know what I'm, you know, I'm just using terminology here. We, we don't have a clue what real crucifixion would feel like, but anyway, that, that's what we go, oh, you know, my example is, oh, I got a splinter from the cross, you know. <laughs> you know, it hurts, you know. And, you know, we're, we're going, you know, it hurts because we're more focused on how they're treating us than we are glorifying the Father by the selfless one. It's about us. It is. It's about us, and that's, and that's when we get our feelings hurt, and that's when we're all wrapped up in it. We go, and we look at them while they're nailing us to the, to the cross, and we, we, we see their rage or whatever, you know, and we see all the junk going on, and we go, well, you know, they're just mean. <laughs> well, yeah, they, they were before that. But, you know, it's a revelation to you. You know, God's kind of going... Guess what? You know, the only one who isn't is that one that I put on the cross and that I, that's in you to be able to not fight back or, you know, but to, but to win through weakness. Anyway, we're not going to teach 1 Corinthians 1 and 2, 3, and really the whole book. Again, um, but... Um, Let's see where, where I was at here. The sacrifices required by God were to be free will offerings. And that offering was to the Father. It was a sweet savor to God. You know what? I don't know that there was, I mean, I'm just, I'm trying to picture being a priest and offering up a sacrifice and everything. And it's on the brazen altar, you know, and it's the smells going up. I don't know. They sat there and went, well, that smells good, you know. You know, I, I, because you do realize that it wasn't like, you know, barbecue. <laughs> First of all, there was blood. I mean, you know, it's slaughtered and you smell, I don't know if you smell blood, but it's not good. And then all this, and it's not a, it's not, but it was to God. Because of his, the spirit, the selfless, sacrificial spirit in it. So that means as many times as we've ever been, I'm just using this terminology, but as many times as we've ever been crucified and thought it brought glory to God, the death in itself is not what brings God glory. They, who knows, these guys that hung Jesus on the cross, maybe they got hacked off at the two thieves on either side of them, too. Maybe, they, you know, maybe, you know, I mean, I, I've thought about that before. My God, they were just thieves, you know. I mean, they were, there's a lot worse crimes out there to hang somebody on a cross, you know. So maybe they just, maybe they're just normal tenor is if somebody crosses them and they don't like them, they'll just give them the worst punishment possible. Which, guess what? If that were the case, then their motive is no different in hanging those guys on the cross than it was Jesus or Jesus than them. See? So, you know. Anyway, again, we get all wrapped up in all of that. And we're going, you know, they've got, they've got bad motives. And, you know, this is all, be, all because, of, because I'm such a saint. No. No, it's not. Um, you're, and you're not. God is hoping to get his son. That's what his, that's what his desire is. Christ in you, the hope of glory, is not just your hope. It's God's hope. He hopes to get Christ in you. I don't know. Well, that's, we, we always read everything. And realize, well, Christ in, in me is my hope of glory. Well, it's God's too. You know, you're just hoping. He's really desiring, you know. <clears throat> All right, so what was given and given up had to be done in a, in a sacrificial and selfless manner. The spirit and manner in which the Son of God gave himself is enumerated in Philippians. Philippians chapter 2, 1 through 8 proves that Jesus' lordship is completely premised 
on his lowliness, selflessness, and depth to which he gave himself, and not upon any worthiness had before crucifixion. Now, if you don't agree with that, though, that's okay, because we're going to really get into the scriptures, and we're going to show this thing, okay? So it's, so it's okay to disagree. But, you know, it's, you, you should never just believe anything I say unless you take it to the Lord, and the Lord shows it to you also. So I, and I say my wording, and I say weird things, and I put things in weird ways that can really blow people's mind. So, there's, so I, I just want to make it clear, it's okay to not agree with everything I say. But my request is, even if you don't agree with everything, please take the time, go before the Lord, and just say, Lord, is this true? I mean, I remember when I was in Bible school, and some teacher would say something that I, I didn't agree with, and I go, well, I don't agree with this. I remember I was, I was upset, I can't be, I don't agree with that, you know? That can't be true. And the Holy Spirit sort of said to me, oh, oh, since you know everything, then there's no area that you don't know. Then, you know, there isn't the, poss the slightest possibility that this could be true, and it's just an area that you don't know yet. Well, yeah, that could be. <laughs> yes, Lord, that could be the case. And then I realized, you know, I don't know hardly anything, but I am getting the blessing of knowing the Lord. Okay? And, and Scripture says we'll be learning him throughout the all eternal ages to come. It says that in Ephesians. So I'm not waiting until eternity. <laughs> I, just, I just love him now. <clears throat> um, okay, so... Uh, instead, it is the attitude within the incarnation and the crucifixion itself that precipitated his exaltation to lordship. And that's what I was trying to bring out in my emphasizing the word in verse 6, who being in the form of God, didn't think, he didn't think it was something he had to grasp after. Remember, we talked about that last class. Something he had to grasp after, uh, but he made himself of no reputation. And he took upon himself the form of a servant. And he became obedient. Do you see this? It, do you, can you see the spirit that this thing is trying to communicate that Jesus is t doing every step of the way? It's all selflessly giving it up, not fighting for it. And in fact, in a sacrificial manner, Glorifying God by that Spirit. That's what you. That's what it. That's what it is. Focusing and pinpointing and coming down on. And and if we look close enough, then we don't see Scripture. We see the inner being of Jesus. We see the spirit in which he does this instead of, well, I'm glad he did it, yeah. I'm glad Jesus died for me. I'm not going to hell. How about yourself? Yay! You know, and what is all that shouting about? We're not going to hell. Instead of, do you know what kind of spirit he did that in? <laughs> you know, do you understand this Jesus that did this? <clears throat> all right, so... Um, This chapter in Philippians, along with the exaltation of Christ, is specifically connected with his attitude of self-abasement, willingness to appear less than what he was. All right, but just right there. An attitude of self-abasement. Let this mind be in you. An attitude. I mean... Is, is, it, is it getting real when, it, when you see it like that? You know, an attitude. We see in Jesus an attitude of self-abasement. Let this mind be in you. Let this attitude be in you. Okay. Well, I don't, you know, there, you know, Brother Randy, there's enough things in this life that push us down. 
I don't think I need to get much lower. I mean, life has beaten me down pretty good. There's very few opportunities for me really to step forward and show my talent or what, you know, whatever, or, or show, you know, that I'm special in some way. <clears throat> well, the truth is none of those uh, abasing circumstances that are happening in your life are usually you making yourself of no reputation. It's them making you of no reputation. And if, and so there is no willing, you know, self-abasement in that going on. <clears throat> uh, so an attitude of self-abasement, willingness to appear less than what he was. Okay, um, willingness. This is the Son of God, and that's why he said, "Who in, being in the form of God." Willingness to appear less than what he was. All right. <clears throat> Just being incarnated as a man was a big drop. All right. But then, <laughs> but then he goes around and he's washing people's feet and he's feeding people and he's taking care. He's, he's just, you know, and then he's put on a cross with other criminals Willingness to appear. Huh. Well, Lord, if you ordered these circumstances, then I'll be, I'll bear them for you. Is that, is that true willingness? I mean, do you see the difference? Is that true willingness? Or is that resigning yourself that this must be a season where things are going to go bad and people are going to, you know, and I'll get out of it, you know, don't worry, I'll come back, baby, you know, and uh, that sort of thing. Not an ounce of that is Christ, and not a, none of that glorifies the Father. And clearly there is a lack of having this mind in you. <clears throat> willingness to appear less than what he was. Oh, my God. To be God? You know? God hung on a cross? God crucified? What would it take for that to happen on the part of mankind? What sort of forces would they have to marshal to be able to grab God and hang him on a cross? There are, there is, it's impossible. Okay, then, then, then we must consider the other alternate. And what kind of heart would it take for God to come down here and let mankind crucify him and say, Father, forgive them. They know not what they do. What kind of, you know, I mean, we have to see his greatness before that is ever going to, be worked in us and his greatness is his lowliness his meekness his humility not false humility not fake humility a willingness to appear less than what he was and accept and and an acceptance of rejection shame Defilement to help those who are the truly unworthy. I think I need one of those throat things. I have some in my office, unless you've got one. All right. <clears throat> so, rejection, shame, and defilement for those who are the truly unworthy. We're talking Romans 5 now. I'm sure you're familiar with, you know, he died for the ungodly. Uh I don't know, this is something that I, thank you, something that I pondered as I was going through the scriptures once is I kept seeing that Jesus' death was for the ungodly or for sinners or, you know, he died for sinners, you know, or, he, you know, he came not for the well but for the sick, you know. And 
I went through, you know, I went through this little bugged period where, you know, you're doing this for all the worst people. I mean, the wording, I mean, you're doing this for all the worst people. Thank God I didn't say, well, what about us good people? <clears throat> Trust me, I knew better. <laughs> I knew better. But I noticed the wording. The wording just kept coming up that way, and I thought, you know, he died for all men. I mean, why didn't it over and over just say all men, you know, the ungodly and the, you know, all men? And just do it like that. But it always seems to say the worst. And I, I, I just didn't understand it until I realized, number one, really and truly, we're all ungodly and we're all the worst. But, um, but I think, again, and see, I'm always looking for little signals, little flags that will help me know the Lord. I think that it was trying not just to tell us a fact that he died for us because we were sinners, but that his way, his nature is, he willingly dies for his enemies, for his murderers, that they might be saved, they might be free. All right. Again, uh, just another picture, just another breath of the Holy Spirit going, you know, you feel Jesus in it, and you just go, oh, God, you're, you know, you know, you, you think I, I wrestle, I've wrestled with uh, situations and people, and Jesus didn't, he, that, they were his, his mission, his love, his you know, and I fight it tooth and nail, or I or I develop s extremely creative plans in my mind of what this really is, and make it so spiritual. And you know, you know, it, it's not Jesus, but at least I've got myself covered, so so I just don't go off in a rage. Anybody know what I'm, <laughs> you know, or, or go kill the ones that I'm supposed to be dying for? <laughs> well, we can hear this and live in condemnation over it. That's not the goal. The goal is first let's see the Lord, and then let's let the Holy Spirit conform us to that image. But to see Him, the the privilege of seeing the true Jesus instead of the one that the world wants to paint to us. Um, and again, I, I, you know, I always have to do these disclaimers because I'm not, try, I'm not saying that in comparison to, to, you know, well, everybody else is off and they don't see. It's not that. It's just that my heart, and I know many of you here, our heart, we just want to know the Lord. And, and if, if we're condemned over that, you know, then so be it. But let's press on, and we do, and we have, and we will, by the grace of God. All right, so, therefore we see from Philippians that he raised one who died selflessly for others. The resurrection was God's recognition of Christ possessing and nobly displaying attributes that are honored by him. Now, there's a bigger explanation of that, but that's a, that's a key to help you get through the door when you want. Consider that there are attributes Attributes of nature, the, the attributes in themselves can't be it. It must emanate, it must proceed from the nature. But you have to see the attributes help you discern the kind of tree it is. It's the fruit. You, you see what I'm saying? 
if it had no fruit and that one had no fruit, you might not be able to tell much. Well, they got a trunk and they got leaves and they got branches. But this, this tree, this Calvary, this cross, there we see the depth of attributes. Let this mind be in you. <clears throat> so um, attributes that are honored by him. The proof that this very thing is what God was exalting can be seen in the fact that Paul is setting forth this kind of mind to the divisive church at Philippi in order to remedy the situation as well as to bring pleasure to God by Christ. This man is an apostle. He is trying to fix their situation, but he doesn't just, he's not just a fixer. That's the good thing. That's one of the things I really found out about Paul that I really, really appreciated. It appears in, in his letters and the way that he writes, it appears to us that he's writing to all these churches trying to fix these churches. I am here to tell you, from what I've seen, and again, I'm no master on any of this, but from what I've seen, he is first and foremost trying to communicate Christ to them so that Christ may be a glory to the Father. And he does that. I mean, if you, if you could somehow, I mean, and maybe many of you already have that, but if you, if you could take that mindset and put it on and start reading through the Bible, you would see it over and over that it's, he's not just fixing. He, you know, he, and, and so we read that stuff and we go, well, here there, Paul's trying to fix his churches, so I'm trying to fix mine. You see what I'm saying? But isn't the fix Christ? Isn't the, isn't the answer, the divisiveness of that church at Philippi was not a subject or a theme. It was Christ, but it wasn't just Christ. It was Christ crucified. You see that? I mean, it, re it really is there. And then, so from just that example, then you see this guy, he's going, look, I can just see the wheels turning in his head. He goes, you know, just to make this church here at Philippi run smoothly, I can't, I can't live that way. I can't live just doing that. If it doesn't bring glory to God by Christ Jesus, then forget it. So he, so he's, so he's there going. Okay, he's he's like they're empty shells, and that's why they're having divisions and fighting and all that. And he's going, he's trying to put Jesus, he's trying to put Christ crucified into them. That mind and that spirit and that way. And he goes that way. There's a sweet savor, and God's getting Jesus. And one of the results is there's not as divisive and everything. They're both they're all laying down their life now. You see, and then he goes. Christ is, there's been an increase of Christ. There's been an increase of the glory of God. There's been a decrease of all this fighting and stuff. Woo! You, you know, you see what I mean? And, of course, I'd say every pastor and whatever wants to see less, you know, divisiveness and stuff in churches, you know? But you, you can't write, you know, divisiveness on the board and go, well, now we're going to deal with that. You can't. You have to write Christ on the board and say, we need to know him. And if we do, and if we're changed into that same image from glory to glory, then it's going to cut down all that. But that's going to be a byproduct of an increase of Christ. And, and even if we did that, if we could produce that without an increase of Christ, the Father wouldn't get any glory by his, by his son. So, some of you are also seeing my mindset many, many years back where I went, so I'm, I'm going to quit dealing with this stuff. You can't counsel the old man out of somebody. You have to take him to the cross. I mean, you do. And that's what Paul preached. So, for me... Um, 
these recognitions keep coming. They just keep coming, and they keep challenging my understanding, and they keep challenging my view, and the, and the scriptures keep, keep first challenging, and then it's as if Christ rises up out of the scriptures, and I go, okay, there he is. Okay, now that's what I want. That's what I need. That's what's precious to me. I don't, and I'll say it like this, I don't want to be a good pastor. I want... Christ out of me to the sheep. And I don't want a church that's perfect. I want Christ formed in us. Because if Christ is being formed in us, folks, that means we're still not perfect because he's being formed. B-E-I-N-G, an ongoing process, right? Being formed is an ongoing process. So perfection is not yet come. Well, I don't care. That, that goes contrary to most Christians and most pastors, but I don't care. As long as we're proceeding in conforming to his image, I'm going to be okay. And if I get everybody moving in that direction, not that I would get them doing it, but I mean, if as a pastor, whatever part I would play, if I could get them moving in that direction, then when I'm dead and gone and they keep moving that direction, maybe they'll move people in that direction and they'll live that way instead of just being Christian. Well, I'm just a cultural Christian. You know, this is the day that the Lord had made. No, check it out. That scripture's talking about Christ crucified. It is. It is. <laughs> it is. You know, it's like, this is the day. No, the day of the cross is, is the day that we should rejoice and be glad in it. <clears throat> Anyway, check it out. Those are things that you, you need to check out. You need All of this you need to check out. Again, don't believe me. <clears throat> all right. Um, let me try to get through this paragraph here. Paul sees that the great need of this church lies in the area of the possession of these attributes. And, and now he knows it's going to be Christ and Christ crucified and the mind of Christ in them. But remember how he begins it with the first couple of verses. Um, I want you to be like-minded, he says. All right. Now, okay. You ever heard that taught in the church? Or, you know, well... Uh, book of Acts. Well, they were in one place in one accord. So if people were in one place, let's get in one accord. Okay, well, let, those are pretty small cars. I don't think we can all fit in them. <laughs> Japanese got that, didn't they? There is uh, behind Paul's words when he doesn't just flat say it, there is it's like, it's like he's got this mind, and it's like a tunnel. And, and on this end is this little petty, little problematic world. And on this side is, is an opening to the fullness of God. And so when this comes in, and he says it, even when he doesn't just spell it out exactly, he says, he says we need to be of one Let's say uh, that we be like-minded. Now, he knows that he's talking about the mind of Christ. No, he's talking about the mind of Christ crucified or the attributes or the attitudes, right? I mean, he is because that's what he says just a few verses down. Okay, so, so he's, he, when he says like-minded, he, he's got it in there, you know what I mean? He's, he knows what he's talking about. He is not... Foolishly thinking we're all going to be like-minded in the, in the natural. Um, having the same love, not love, but the same love. The same was in the beginning with God. The same is always Christ. If you ever get a chance to check it out. In the beginning was the word, words with God. The same was with God. The same there is talking about Christ. 
And when you find something that it says the same mind or the same love, it's, it must be Christ or it's not the same. It's a copy. <clears throat> and that's a, just another little search thing if you get a chance to do it. <clears throat> Having the same love, being of one accord of, now it's not just like-minded, but one mind, one mind, one. Okay? And then, let nothing be done through strife or vainglory, but in lowliness of mind. And then finally, verse 5, let this mind. All of those references to the mind are the cross mind, is the cross mind. In order to get them more open to these attributes, he presents Christ crucified as the basis of Jesus' own exaltation. In other words, um, He's showing two things here. He's showing, he said, he, they're, they're striving. And, you know, have you ever tried to break apart two people that are going at each other? It's a tough job. You know, it's a tough job. <clears throat> so instead of going, you know, trying, now let's calm down and we'll talk it over. He just goes right to the thing and he goes, okay, look at this. Look at Jesus. Do you, do you both love Jesus? Oh, yeah, we both love Jesus. Okay. Well, Jesus laid down his life. He became this. He did this and that and that. And God exalted him because of this lowliness of mind. And then he starts showing he, he glorified the Father through this. So if anybody's got a heart for the Lord at all, they'll cut the fighting and all the junk for long enough to go, well, I want to glorify the Lord. And, and they'll say, because usually they're not there yet, they'll say, well, I want to be exalted too. You know, Little do they know you don't get there except through the cross. It's the only, that's the only road to that. <clears throat> All right, so um, he also shows the extreme pleasure had by the Father because of Jesus' actions. These same attributes are shown to be of the highest order of importance to the Almighty and are what exalted Jesus. All right, we'll stop here and come back.